What's up guys, Partime Gamer Dad here, and today I'm giving you my review of Crown Jewel 2024. Now, I'm just going to come out right off the bat and say that Crown Jewel 2024 was probably the weakest PLE of the year by WWE so far. It doesn't mean it was bad or awful. It's not like a 2019 pay-per-view, uh, Thunderdome pay-per-views, even some other shows we've seen over the last few years that just weren't quite good. But of all of the stellar shows that have occurred up until this point in WWE over the course of the year, this one is definitely the weakest so far. Whether it's the fact that Saudi shows don't feel particularly canon, although there's a lot of canon type events that are happening on the show, or the fact that it just felt lacking compared to expectations. It just missed the mark in a lot of ways, but there were some high spots. So let's get into my review of Crown Jewel. Kicking us off with the Bloodline versus Roman Reigns and the Usos. The Bloodline defeated Roman and the Usos in a way that I thought was just fine. Um, you know, Jacob fought two coming in and helping Solo Sokoa pin Roman Reigns after taking him out with his uh, moonsault and then Solo hitting uh, Roman Reigns with back-to-back -back, uh, spikes. I thought it was just okay. Um, the crowd wasn't as invested in a Roman match as I would anticipate or a Bloodline match in general. Um, and also, the, the finish was kind of screwy because there was actually a three-count of Solo pinning Roman before the planned finish, which was how the match actually ended. But... Uh, one of the Usos was late to breaking up the count after Solo hit the first spike the first time on Roman. And so the three count actually happened, which is kind of crazy in retrospect. So technically Solo has pinned Roman twice uh, at Crown Jewel. And he pinned John Cena last year, so like he's Mr. Crown Jewel. All that being said, I don't think I can give this higher than three and a half stars. It's not a bad match. It's just not as great as you would expect a, a six-man tag between Roman and the Usos versus Solo Sokoa, Jacob Fatu, and Tabatanga. The after uh, match uh, part of the story with Sami Zayn coming out and acting like he was going to hug Solo Sokoa and then hitting an exploder suplex and then accidentally hitting a haluva kick on Roman when Solo got out of the way. I think it's good storytelling and we're going to continue to see some of that story play out, I anticipate, over the next few weeks. And obviously this is all building to um, Bad Bloodline versus OG Bloodline at uh, Survivor Series in, in a War Games match. Um, hopefully they keep it four on four. I think that's appropriate. You don't need to bring in additional people. There's enough of the story beats and, 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 and backstory in general to this match just to have the four on four. Um, and then, of course, that's where OG Bloodline gets the win. And maybe we have The Rock return after that to kind of take over the new uh, Bloodline 2.0, Bad Bloodline, whatever you want to call them, Timu version of Bloodline. Uh, but in the in the context of this match, while okay, it was by far and away one of the worst bloodline matches I think we've seen. Probably the worst bloodline match since Jimmy versus Jay um, at WrestleMania or Jay versus Roman at SummerSlam a couple of years ago. So I give this one three and a half stars. The next match, we had the four-way tag team match for the Women's Tag Team Championships with Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill successfully retaining in a really fun, really explosive match. The Meta Girls had a great showing, I think, showing that they belong on the main roster, especially in the tag division, and create a little bit more um, excitement and energy in that division. Chelsea and, and Piper are great. They, they had, a, had a lot of great spots, like Piper hitting the Vader Bomb on Chelsea by accident, which I thought was awesome. And then um, Kyrie Sane and Io Sky are just so incredibly athletic, so incredibly gifted, and two of the best women's wrestlers on the roster. So they had a great showing as well. This was really fun. It was just really, really fast paced, really high energy. Uh, there was nothing that really dragged down the match overall. It just didn't have a whole lot of time to it. I think overall, I would give this also three and a half stars, a really fun match. And I think it almost over delivered against expectations. Whereas if you look at the Roman and Usos versus Bloodline match it under delivered, but they all kind of landed in the same place at the end of the day. So I would give this a very similar score at three and a half stars. Next up, I have Seth Rollins defeating Bronson Reed. And if you have seen my shorts um, here on YouTube, one of my most recent ones was around how Seth defeating Bronson Reed felt very similar to how Seth Rollins defeated Shinsuke Nakamura during his world championship reign around this time last year. The only difference 
is that Bronson wasn't made to be looked at as incredibly weak or necessarily inferior. But the entire time we've been watching this feud, you know, play out over the last few months, and even before this, like you think about all the litany of injuries that the commentary team and really the WWE has communicated about Seth Rollins over the last year plus. There's no reason that he should have beat Bronson Reed. I think, honestly, this could have been an opportunity for Bronson Reed to become a main event player. And I know a lot of times we talk about wins and losses don't matter because they don't necessarily all the time, but sometimes they do. And for Bronson Reed to lose to Seth Rollins when he's already in this space of like he he's working through injuries and all these things in his back and and it kind of makes him look dumb that he didn't pit him after the first tsunami. Um, it's just all these things are, are a little frustrating. Also, the match was incredibly short. It felt rushed, um, which I don't think it would have felt rushed if you had had the right outcome and have Bronson Reed just, you know, eviscerate Seth Rollins and put him back on the shelf. Like, what a story that would have been. The way they can redeem this long term is have Bronson Reed defeat Seth Rollins at Survivor Series. I think the story is going to continue as evidenced by Bronson Reed standing up after uh, three stomps, including a curb, a super curb stomp. Um from Seth Rollins for Seth to win the match. So all that being said, I've been waffling between a few scores. Um, I would give this one, uh, I feel like I can't go above a three. And I know a lot of people are going to fight me on this. I feel like all the pre-match stuff was, was good, but the whole Seth winning element really took away from me being able to give this match a higher star rating and i love seth seth is one of my guys especially in the modern day wwe ecosystem he could have lost here and it would have made sense it would not have devalued him because now you're going to have him lose closer to royal rumble have him lose closer to wrestlemania against bronson reed you can have him get his win back and then move on to the punk feud or whatever might play out for him at wrestlemania him losing to bronson reed here would have solidified bronson reed as a world beater as a guy who belongs in the main event scene and is here to stay. And you could have Bronson Reed go after somebody like a Gunther or if Damian Priest wins the title, uh, which I don't think he will, or if CM Punk wins the title, which I don't think he will. But whoever might win that title down the road, you have Bronson Reed be an immediate contender at any given moment. Now, it doesn't feel as much that way. Um, it, it just makes it seem like uh, he's one of those monsters of the week. Uh, for Seth Rollins to overcome, very similar to like a King Kong Bundy to Hulk Hogan back in the day. So I know I'm ranting about all, uh, this a lot. I, I'm just really upset Bronson Reed didn't get his win that at this point in his career and in the context of the story makes the most sense. So I, I, I have to give it no more. And I feel like I'm even being generous here just because I like these two guys a lot. But I'm going to give it three stars. Next up, we had, I think, the shortest match of the night and definitely the weakest the most overbooked match of the night, and that was Liv Morgan defeating Nia Jax for the first ever Women's Crown Jewel Championship. Listen, this was half of a match, and the other half was taken up by Tiffany Stratton teasing a cash-in, and Nia Jax being frustrated, and then Dom and Raquel Rodriguez and Liv all triple-teaming to take out Nia Jax, and it just felt really lacking. It felt pretty lame, and I'm sure, like, Rhea would have been involved if she was healthy, uh, but it just felt, I don't know, the, everything about this match felt like a bunch of nothing outside of Tiffany going to cash in. But this match, I, I, I feel like Tiffany, I'm sorry, Liv and, and Nia just didn't mesh well together, um, personally. Um, there were some good moments, but overall, this this didn't feel like a match. It felt like an angle. It felt like a moment, um, it be, partly because it was a four-minute match. That was then overly padded by four minutes of Tiffany Stratton trying to build a storyline and trying to further the Nia versus Tiffany angle when they're still friends. So are they friends now? Does Nia hate Tiffany now? When Dom and Raquel are the ones who cost her, even though Tiffany slid in the uh, briefcase, which is a nice callback to like when Finn did that to Damien. But like everything here just felt unnecessary. Uh, I give it two and a quarter stars. You could have had a, a lot of different ways for this match to go and it would have played out much better. These two did fine, but overall this match is, it really shows why like champion versus champion is difficult to book and there's always going to be some kind of schmaz, I feel like, because you want to protect both champions, but there is, a I think, a, an okay way to do it and then there's this, which is overly booked, gratuitous, get everybody involved and then have, in my opinion, 
um, the wrong person win because, uh, you know, she's not really going to do anything with it from here on out. Um, whereas Naya could have another thing that she's done. Uh, and then Tiffany beating her makes it feel like even bigger of a deal. But whatever. Two and a half, I'm sorry, two and a quarter stars. That in itself. Again, I feel like I'm trying to be nice because I, I can tell everybody worked hard. But this match was... This this was a, a nothing match that tried to present it as something really big, and it, it was overbooked to hell. Next up, a match that didn't even take place, but it kind of became a segment, almost like an angle, and we're going to grade the angle. We're going to grade the segment, and that's Kevin Owens versus Randy Orton. Match didn't take place. They just started beating the heck out of each other, and then you had the RKO to Adam Pearce. Uh, Kevin Owens is taking out referees. They fight through the crowd, and then Kevin Owens takes out Randy Orton, dives on top of him through uh, some of the tables on the side there. Man, this this as a segment, as a moment, as an angle, was really well executed, and Orton attacking Adam Pierce, like, I give this a 9 out of 10. I think the only thing I would have liked to have seen was less of Orton getting, like, the upper hand on Kevin Owens. I really, I said it in my predictions, I would have just liked to see Kevin Owens just destroy Randy Orton through this whole thing. Having a match would have been really great. And just watching Kevin Owens destroy uh, Randy Orton, similar how I would have wanted to see Bronson Reed destroy Seth Rollins, but even more so. And he did to a degree, but Randy Orton got a little too much uh, offense in. But all that being said, Randy Orton RKOing Adam Pearce is a great moment. And he did say, uh, was it Nick Aldis? It might have been Nick Aldis at the time, but... Do you remember when Nick Aldis made Randy Orton pay for RKOing him and he paid in advance uh, for the next time it happens? Maybe that was him just cashing in that extra whatever it was, 50K, uh, so he could RKO another authority figure. Um, this was a great segment. I'm excited to see the match actually happen. I hope it happens at Survivor Series so that we could see Kevin Owens finally solidify himself as a monster heel, not to be taken lightly, and then Randy Orton views this disillusion of uh, him and Kevin Owens as a proper tag team and that friendship and that, and that camaraderie and projects it onto Cody Rhodes. And then we have that feud coming down the road, which I think will be a really great, almost reign-defining feud for uh, Cody Rhodes, if not Kevin Owens or just Cody Rhodes, which I anticipate will also happen pretty soon. This next match, LA Knight successfully retaining his title in a triple threat match against Carmelo Hayes and Andrade, I want to give it such a high rating because, guys, some of these moments in this match, especially between Carmelo and Andrade, were great. LA Knight came in and, and kind of killed some momentum from time to time, but that finish alone, whoa, that finish was incredible. Um, and I like how the match did incorporate all three guys pretty consistently throughout. Um, I think I can't give this more than three and a quarter. I think it wasn't quite as cohesive as like the four-way tag team match uh, like we talked about earlier. But overall, for the, especially the parts where Andrade and Carmelo were against each other, really great, really well-wrestled, really technical, high-flying, a lot of just fun moments. And then LA Knight came in and you know, he's more of a character um, than, than a wrestler, but he still held his own to a degree. He didn't screw up anything majorly or too consistently but there were a couple of moments in there that were awkward and minor botches if you will i do hate that word but that's what they were um but the finish alone almost gives it like a half star on its own so i give this one uh three and a quarter stars i will be curious to see if these guys continue to feud with each other or with la knight uh, and it makes me wonder like who does la knight eventually lose this title to does he eventually go back to being a heel um, after being a face for over a year at this point, he just feels so much more natural as a heel or at least a tweener, which is what he's kind of portrayed himself over the last few weeks. But I'll be curious to see what happens with the U.S. title moving forward. Finally, the main event, the match that should be the match of the night, a five-star classic, no doubt, or at least it should have been. You had Cody Rhodes defeating Gunther to crown Cody Rhodes as the first ever men's crown jewel champion. This match, um, you want to talk about like underperforming against expectations. This is th this is that, but cranked up to eleven. Like this could, match could not have been more underwhelming, especially with the amount of time it had. It just really didn't live up to the expectations. Um, 
And I think a big part of that was because Cody won. Like this was just, it was another exhibition that didn't feel like there was anything to it. The story didn't really work as, as intended, I think. Um, especially because Gunther lost. I think they have Gunther say all these things. And then lose on a roll through on a choke when all he had to do was let go of the chokehold or you know prove that he is a smart uh it has a high ring iq it just it kind of devalued gunther's character to a degree you could have even had goldberg who we, we know he wasn't in the country he was on college game day promoting that he's gonna retire next year have his last match in wwe next year um but you could have had to come out and spear and that would have been great that would have made sense to me in terms of furthering the story but because saudi arabia events tend to be non-canon maybe they shied away from that um the the work rate from the two guys was fine it was fine they didn't do anything egregiously bad um the ending was just really disappointing and the energy for it just never really got there. Never got into that fourth, fifth gear. I feel like this match, maybe I'm underrating it a little bit. I can't. I don't feel like I can go over four. I, I, I even hesitate to put it at three and three quarters. But as a match, it was better than the six-man tag. It was better than the four-way women's match. So I think I will give it three and three quarters. I, I think three and three quarter stars is fair, but disappointing. Like that's an incredibly disappointing score when you consider Gunther alone is in this match. And then you have one of the best in the world right now in Cody Rhodes, like the face of the business, the face of the WWE. And these two guys just couldn't gel well together. And there's a lot of history there, right? Um, they even put it on the graphic. Cody Rhodes has eliminated Gunther in back-to-back -back Royal Rumbles. Uh, Gunther was the longest reigning IC champ. He doesn't get beat very often. When he does, it's a big deal. And he lost on a roll up out of a chokehold. Like Cody got out lucky. And, and what is what? What a weird way to tell the story of the first ever Crown Jewel champion get won the championship because he got lucky. It, it's just it's hard to to swallow. And again, kind of goes back to this whole: it's hard to book champion versus champion because you don't want to devalue either champion. But through that, you devalue both because nobody is declared a definitive winner. And now it feels like the match happened just because the match had to happen. It's kind of like when you had Survivor Series back in the day and you had Raw versus SmackDown. So you always had to have like the WWE champion versus the Universal champion. And it just sometimes you got great matches like AJ versus Brock Lesnar or you got like um, a, uh, Daniel Bryan versus Brock Lesnar. And you get other matches that happened just because they had to happen because oh it's that time of year or like the brand warfare matches of like smackdown versus raw and you just have the draft so all these guys from raw and smackdown just swap places now they have brand loyalty to the place that they were just fighting against a year ago because smackdown versus raw it's brand loyalty brand warfare but they don't have any loyalty to the brand that they're now on versus the one they had a year ago when they were actually loyal or were they ever loyal to that brand are they loyal to wwe right like the story doesn't make sense and this match, in context of a non-canon event, it, it makes sense to a degree, but the way it was executed did not. So maybe I'm talking myself out of my rating, but I'm going to stick with it. Three and three quarter stars. This match could have been so much better. I want to see a properly developed Gunther versus Cody storyline when they're on the same brand. One's a world champion. Maybe neither of them need to be world champions. They're both about being the best in the world. So who is the best? Is it Gunther? Is it Cody? Is it CM Punk? Because he calls himself the best in the world. Like, what are we going to see come from this down the road? How does this feed into any storylines? It serves no purpose storyline-wise. Now you have to have uh, Gunther versus his next contender, Gunther versus Goldberg, Cody versus Kevin Owens. But none of that was furthered here. It just felt like an exhibition for the sake of an exhibition to give Saudi the Arabia their, their little prize. Of, now, great, you have these world champion or these crown jewel championships that you get to keep there. That the person who doesn't even like live in the country won at an event that doesn't even matter. So, yeah, it was, I sound very heated for three and three quarters, but I'll, I'll give it that because these two guys, they did their best with what they had. All right, guys, that's my event, my rant, my review of Crowd Jewel 2024. What did you think of the show? Make sure you let me know down in the comments below. Make sure you like this video if you like video games, wrestling, or the occasional parent humor. And make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. And I will see you very soon.